What's going on everybody? It's Carmine from Bar Mind Tech, and in today's video we're going to talk about making our NAS into a Plex media server. So about a month ago I was looking into making a true NAS box and I realized with my hardware I had it wasn't going to work. So I decided I'm going to get a NAS instead. I had this opportunity to get this QNAP NAS and uh, I don't work with QNAP at the moment so don't you know be like oh it's sponsored because this isn't a sponsored video. This is all me working on my own. So uh, I got the QNAP NAS and I started working with it, I built it out, and then I decided to migrate everything off of what I currently use as my solution, I was using Open Media Vault, which personally I don't really like anymore, there's a lot better options to use than it, but I wanted to get my Plex Media off of it, so I put that on my NAS, and then I decided when I was sending everything back up, why don't I just run Plex off of it, and run it natively, and stop the bottleneck and everything else that's happening so we're going to talk about how you can set up your own Plex media server off your NAS just like this so let's get right into it before we get really into it I'm going to drop some video of what the NAS looks like I'll show you the outside the inside and uh, yeah so I'm going to drop that in right here So this is the NAS that I was actually able to get. It's the TS364. It's from QNAP, and you can see the budget. Uh, the price is 449. You can probably find it elsewhere. You might be able to find it on discount. You might be able to find used ones on eBay. Um, but this is the NAS I have. It supports two and a half gigabyte networking, and we'll go down to the specs, and we'll get really into this. So I have the 4G model that just has 4 gigs of RAM, so if we come down here, it has an Intel Celeron, has a 4 core, 4 thread processor up to 2.9 gigahertz, so you can virtualize off this if you want to. It's a 64-bit architecture, it has 4 gigs of sodium RAM, it is upgradable, so you can upgrade up to 16 gigs, so you can put two 8 gig sticks of sodium in there. Uh, it shows you it's sodium DDR4, pretty nice. So this NAS is a three drive bay, so it supports three three and a half inch drives, and then it also supports two and a half inch. So if you want to do two and a half inch SATA drives like solid states, you can do that as well. Typically large sized SSDs really aren't making sense to be used money wise because they're usually really pricey, uh, unless you have an in on getting them at a low price or maybe you're buying used ones. You could put that in your NAS, it's going to be a lot quieter. That's the one thing I learned is that I put two Seagate NAS drives in here, and they're very noisy. That's my only downfall I have with the NAS at the moment, but we'll talk about that later in the video. You could also put two M.2 drives in here. It supports two of them, which is really nice. You could use their cache in and cache out. So as you're trying to either cache video to be watched or cache video to be installed on, you could use that that way. Really nice feature. And like I said, it has a 2.5 gig Ethernet port, so it only has one port. So like I said earlier, I actually got this NAS originally just in the idea to get my storage off of its current solution into a better solution that's a little more reliable and simpler to use. Uh, I use Open Media Vault in the past, and since I've started it last year, I have had some issues either with my share disappearing or having to rebuild it, or the fact that I haven't been able to update it in over a year. Um, so I'm running a very out-of-date Open Media Vault system just purely because it doesn't update itself. I can't install anything and um, it's very counterintuitive in the UI. I used to use it in the beginning when I first started home labbing on a Raspberry Pi NAS and I thought it was the greatest thing and then after like eight months it would burn out and it would just, oh, I don't work anymore. So I was afraid of that happening with my Plex Media and I didn't want that to happen again. So that's why I looked to get into another solution and this QNAP NAS what I needed it is the perfect solution when I was setting everything back up because I do network everything across as a network drive so I was trying to link it up to my Plex machine so I can have my library and I figured why not just run Plex natively on the NAS it has the hardware and it's been able to support it and I've actually been testing it the last few weeks internally and externally having members of my Plex server use it and we haven't run into any issues it actually always wants to bump the quality up which is really nice to see Every time I watch a show, it pops up, hey, we can increase the, the quality of this uh, stream, so you, you want to do that, and of course I always do. So it's really been nice to use the NAS, and it works so smoothly, and even more, my Plex ran off of my old server. Uh, it's an EATX case. It's huge. It sucks a lot of power, and the NAS is small and probably uses about a quarter of the power. So 
that was my big point in trying to use the NAS as my server in place of my actual server and it's working out really nicely so far but let's keep talking about the NAS and how I set up Plex on it. So to start we'll just talk about the system a little bit more so I know I already kind of went over the specs but we can come in here and we can see it again and like I said I have 4 gigs of usable RAM I do plan to upgrade that in the future I do plan to add two M.2 drives so I have better caching and of course more RAM so I have more usable RAM for the server and for the NAS to be used having 4 cores and 4 threads is really nice because it actually helps the NAS do what I need it to do uh, but these are just the general settings so when you get into your NAS the first time you would set it up you would make a user and then you can come into here and it would have your control panel and your storage and snapshots these are going to be the two biggest ones you're going to use in the beginning so when you do get your NAS you need to make a storage pool it's going to have a wizard that walks you through everything and truthfully the first time I did it I messed everything up I built it out I didn't use all my storage I used the volume that like I used the volume type that really wasn't the best to use I ended up blowing it out and starting over and it was the best thing I could have done instead of trying to keep fixing something that I didn't have set up right originally. Um, if all else does fail, the NAS does have a reset button on it. You have to get like a little pin and there's a little hole in the back of it you just kind of push it through, hold it and it'll reset the NAS and then from there you can get back in and restart everything. So if you lose your password or you lock yourself out during config, it's not over, you can fix it. Um, but this is my storage pool as you can see I have it, my Plex share and I have 25 terabytes. So I did get two 16 gig Seagate NAS drives. I'll show you those right now. So these are actually the drives that I got. I ordered them off Amazon, but I got them at a lower price. So keep an eye on these. You could use like Honey or something else to track the pricing of it. I was able to get these for $2.99 a drive. So definitely look at a better price over the $4.69 original price. Uh, but keep an eye on it and you can definitely find yourself a better deal. Mm -hmm. Or these WD red drives are really good as well because they're also NAS drives. You want to find something that has 7200 RPM and you want it to be CMR. So keep an eye on that and uh, you can find the best NAS drives for you to use. Now do keep in mind, like I was saying, I have these drives, they're really nice, but they are NAS drives. So the drives are constantly spinning up and down and I know I could probably adjust the settings in the NAS but I could hear the drive spinning up and down all the time. You actually might be able to hear it during this video. It's the noisiest part of the NAS and it's the only downfall right now that I'm having. The case around the NAS isn't very thick or it doesn't have any sound deadening on it. So it doesn't drown out the sound at all. So you do hear it. I hear it down the hall at night when I go to bed. I hear the NAS drive spinning up and down all night long until I fall asleep. So it is the downfall of using these but you do have a drive that's intended to be used 24 seven, being spun up and spun down, and it's not gonna get burnt out like a typical consumer drive would be. So it is a trade-off for using NAS drives, or it is something that you can trade off maybe, and you can tuck your NAS into a closet or away somewhere that's not being used. So it does help with the sound part. Um, other than that, the NAS is very quiet. The fans aren't noisy. You don't really hear anything, but the only thing is the drives. So then you would go from there and set up your storage pool. So you would select all your drives. You could use three drives, you could use two drives, you could do one drive. From there you would just have to select what kind of rate type you want. Now I'm only putting Plex Media on here so I really don't care if I lose it at the end of the day. Um, if a drive fails, I lose everything. So that's how this kind of works because I'm running a RAID 1. It's pretty much the same as running a JBOD. There's no redundancy, there's no parity disks. If something dies, it's over which is okay, I'm okay with, because like I said, I don't have any crucial information on these drives that I need. If you're gonna run something that, you know, you need the information off of it, run a RAID 3, I think it is, or a RAID 5 would be the best if you have three drives. You could add the M.2 drives in and it would show you, which is a really nice feature of the control panel, it actually tells you which drives are being used, and even more, I can go in and do a health check. So I can come over here and it'll actually go through and I can see my drive is healthy, gives me all the information on my drive and a uh, nice touch so that's really nice you can see come in quickly and come monitor your drive you can do snapshots which I do have enabled they haven't ran yet because I just set it up the other day but I did that's why I only have 25 terabytes usable because I do have six terabytes used for my snapshots so it's like a backup so it takes a picture says cool if we need to roll back we can roll back other than that, I don't really have anything else being used in here. 
So we can start talking about how I set up Plex. So you can see I actually have Plex already installed, so I'm not gonna be able to show the install process, but the install process is exactly the same as installing Plex on any other machine, except you have a GUI interface to do it with. So we're gonna come over here to the hamburger menu, and then we're gonna come over to App Center, and then here is where we would search up to find Plex. So we're gonna come to all apps in case it doesn't pop up, and I just find it easier to search, and we can just search Plex. Now over here it would say install for you, but I, like I said, I already have it, so I'm, I can't install it again. So you just install it, and then it would install the app. From there, you click open, and it would just run through the wizard, just like setting up any other Plex server when you get into the web interface. You know, you tell it what you want to use, your shares you want to use, who has access, and so on, and then bam, you have your Plex server. So enough of all the talk about the NAS and everything else. Let's actually talk about Plex. The whole point of this video is we're gonna make the Plex server off of this. So I'm not showing the install process because I've already gone over the install process of Plex in previous videos. If you need some help going through the web setup, I'll drop the video and I'll actually cut to the time frame when the web setup gets started. But you can see here's my actual Plex server. And if we come into the settings, I can come over here and we can configure stuff. So so if you've used Plex before, you know that when it's time for an update, it'll give you a little warning up here under the activity, and it'll tell you, hey, there's an update available. My NAS, uh, the Plex running on the NAS is currently up to date, so I can't update it at the moment. But if you do need to update it, I'm going to show you how to manually do it. So there's no way to, that I know of yet to automatically update Plex on the NAS. So I'm just going to show you how to manually do it. It's super simple, and you probably get it done in less than five minutes. So when there's an update available, there's usually a link to pull you to the latest version. So I just went to their website real quick to get the downloads. By default, it's going to show you to choose your platform. You want to choose QNAP, even though it's running like a Linux distro, you need the actual QNAP version. From there, you would just download the package, and it's going to be like a .q, I want to say, file or something like that. Um, but you would download that, and then you'd come back over to your NAS. You would open up App Center. And then up here in the corner, you can see there's install manually. And then from there, you would browse, find the package you just downloaded, and install it. Now, it's going to tell you if you download the wrong version, it's not going to take like a .deb file, even though it runs a Linux distro, it's not going to accept it. You need the one over here that's set for QNAP. It's made for the NAS software, and it's going to be able to run it. Now, when you do install it, don't worry, it's just going to overwrite the current one and update the version. It's not going to wipe out that, uh, your Plex server and you have to start all over. It's just going to update it. I've done it before and it works, so don't worry about that. Uh, we'll just go over some other quick things in here. So if we come into transcoding, I don't remember if this is exactly the hardware needed to transcode. It could probably transcode over the CPU, so I just have it on automatic. In the past, I've actually transcoded most of my media with TDAR. Um, it wasn't the best solution, but it worked at the time. So a lot of my media is already transcoded. And then we have you know, the other basic stuff from here. We can set our quality. I kept on a lot of the default stuff just because I wanted to test out see how it actually works first. Uh, we have you know the general settings. And that's really it for that. Um, you have your remote access, so if you do change over from your old Plex server to a new a new one, let's say you run on a new device, whether it's a NAS or new Linux box, whatever it may be, remember that you need to change your port forwarding rules. And another big thing to remember is you need to manage your library access. So if you do have existing users on your old Plex server, you need to give them access on your new Plex server. So you would have to come into here and you would have to select the user and then check off all the new libraries you want them to access on the new server. I didn't realize this. I thought it just said everybody was good. They weren't, and nobody had access to my Plex server. So make sure if you are going to migrate from an old server to a new server, you give everybody access again. Other than that, we just have some simple stuff. Other than that, really, we just have you know the basic stuff on here. We can see our system specs going through. Uh, my bandwidth usage, CPU, and memory. Uh, other than that, that's really about it for the Plex server. Like I said, I've been using it for about two weeks now, and I'm impressed. Um, I enjoy what you know watching Plex. I watch it all the time with my girlfriend. We're watching shows, and being able to watch it off a smaller box that doesn't make a big deal is really nice. So it's good to work out this way. So. 
lately my whole idea has been trying to downgrade from my massive equipment that I use in my home lab into something that's smaller, more efficient, and just really makes more sense. And migrating to this QNAP NAS really made sense in my eyes. I was able to free up more resources on my server and actually power down a lot more machines than I'm not using. And instead just run one on this QNAP box. So it works as I'm able to get more drive space. So I was able to increase my storage where I was limited on my old server. I didn't have a room to anymore. The QNAP NAS is using less power than my old server is. And it's a lot smaller so I can tuck it away in the corner when I'm ready to. Uh, currently it sits on top of my tenant server rack and it works nicely because that's how I cabled everything up. But other than that, so far I've really enjoyed using the QNAP NAS. I did have some issues with the networking in the beginning, but that was just me being silly with Linux. Uh, I'm not the strongest person to network in Linux yet. I am learning and that was my issue. But the QNAP NAS has been perfect. It's performed really good so far. Like I said, the only thing I did have was the Seagate drives are really loud. So if you do get NAS drives, expect them to be loud. Um, other than that, the QNAP NAS has been a great product. I really like their UI and everything else that goes with it. I have no complaints so far. And we're gonna do a follow-up video in the future when I have more experience with the NAS and everything else so we can review it and really give my thoughts on it. So I hope you guys like this video and I'll see you in the next one.